I wanted to introduce myself. I'm Wynne McDaniel. I'm head of the um, Horseneck DAR chapter, Daughters of the American Revolution. And we're pleased to, uh, this is our third event, or um, you know, Fred asked uh, Missy to come in. But uh, anyway, I did want to talk a little bit about our chapter. Again, it's Horseneck, which was the original name of Greenwich before it became Greenwich. We're a new chapter. If uh, I could give you all a homework assignment, if you'd like some help in doing research on any of your ancestors, please let us know. We'd love to have you join our chapter. Uh, just as a little um, tidbit, when uh, Missy was at Central Middle School many moons ago, she pulled out a book of land deeds, and that's what really kind of sparked her interest in writing four books. And so with that, uh, we're so happy that she's taken this on as a passion to talk to us and educate us all about our, our roots here in Greenwich and the history of um, our town. So with that, I'd, I'd like to just turn it over to our first selectman, and then we'll get right into it with Missy. Thanks, Wynne. Thank, thank okay. you so much, Wynne. Um, actually, I have some interns for you if you need any help. So. <laughs> Um, I do. We'll talk to you after. But thank you all for coming. This is a great crowd. Um, Missy and I talked uh, the last time at the library, and a bunch of us had to leave, or a few of us had to leave, so I was uh, kind of jealous that everybody else got to see the presentation. So as a, as a townie, as somebody who loves the history here and someone who taught history, um, this is something that uh, is right up my alley. But I don't know everything because Missy just taught me a couple things about our seal and General Putnam. So uh, <laughs> I'm eager to, to hear more. So Missy, thank you so much and welcome to Town Hall. Thanks, Fred. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I don't know, uh, there's a camera somewhere, but I don't know where it is. But anyway, um, uh, you know, the, the earliest history of Greenwich, I, I just want to preface it by saying it's not a nice story. It's really a very ugly story. And um, when I started my research, I kept wondering, well, this story is so amazing and dramatic. Why am I not reading stories about what happened from people who were involved in it? And one day then it, it dawned on me, I really feel that... Um, People were ashamed of what their ancestors did, and um, I think, and also they feared retaliation. So there are a, not a lot of first-hand reports, but luckily, since we were uh, really part a Dutch territory in the first 16 years, I found a lot of our records were not here, not in Hartford, but they were in Albany, New York, because we were part of Dutch New York. So let me start by telling you, you know, my research got so involved in it because it was so giving. There was so much that happened here. I have to do this. We had to make a choice between power and clicker. And so I had, my clicker is not working, but my laser is. And so I have to advance it this way. So I just want to orient you a little bit with uh, where we are, the, the, the power players at the time of the really 1620s. In, in England, you know, here we have the major power players, the, those who controlled global trade were really part of what happened in the United States. And there was England, of course, uh, you know, the great British Empire was building, and right across the way was the New Netherlands and, and the Dutch West Indies Company. And the Dutch West India Company was really a company that the government outsourced their foreign relations to. So it wasn't really the government of Orange Nassau, it was the Dutch West India Company who really uh, colonized parts of South America, the Caribbean, you know, of course Manhattan, and all over the world. And they were fighting with the English for, you know, over hundreds of years. They were always battling each other for, you know, who would control global trade, and they were, there were many wars. The most violent were the Anglo-Dutch wars, and there were a series of about four or five or six of them. The other player at that time were the Spanish, and of course the Spanish had gone down into South America and wreaked havoc with the Maya and, and the Inca there in their quest for gold, sending it 
they would go down to South America, you know, take that gold and other things, and then they would sail back home, and in sailing back home, they would come up the coast of North America. So when the Dutch uh, started their colony in New York, really the reason for it was to have a fort here in the New York area to pirate passing Spanish ships. Um, so there were really four fights for Greenwich. You know, we were sort of born of conflict, and I'll go over each of them. The first was the Dutch versus the Native Americans here. Then the English versus the Dutch. New Haven Colony got involved with threatening our founding woman, one of two, uh, Elizabeth Phones Winthrop V. Hallett. Uh, and then the New York Colony versus Connecticut Colony helped make us what we are today all pretty colorful um, episodes. I'm sorry. So I'll, I'm gonna go, you know, take that in order. The Dutch against the Americans, of course there were cultural, technical, you know, there were disease influences, differences between the two cultures. It was a dramatic culture clash of one society that has different technology, has different disease pathology, and different cultures, they just could not understand each other. And I'm sorry, I, it's kind of weird for me to do this. Maybe I can hold this. Um, so who, who lived here in the very beginning? It was the Munsees. They used to be called the Lenape, but the, uh, the people who study this, primarily Robert Grumet, who is now a retired professor at University of Pennsylvania, has put out his research of his lifetime. And this was Munsee country on this side of the Hudson River here. And the larger groups of the, were the Quiripes in uh, White Plains area, of course the Pequots up by Fairfield. And then the Mahicans were inland upper New York State. And then uh, the Montaukets at the end of Montauk. So some, you can see some of their names are in our names today. But that's the group name, the greatest group name that we speak of it. And then there's subgroups within that. So in our area specifically, uh, within a, the, uh, a subgroup of the Munsees, the, the group here is called the Wekaskek or the Wekasqueak. It's written either way. A lot of the time the English would just shorthand it and call them the Wickers Creeks. And the, they had a, one of their great fortresses was over in Dobbs Ferry, one of their greatest fortresses. And it's on, right on the, the tributary from the Hudson River into Westchester County, which is called Wickers Creek. But now that site of the, one of their greatest castles is, the, you know, the town fought it for years, but the developer won, and it's now a giant uh, condo development. Uh, but you, you can also see that the groups on Manhattan were called the Manhattans. There's in Long Island the uh, Rockaways, the Merricks, the Massapequas, the Secatogs, the Minit uh, Matinicocks, I mean, all familiar names. And across the Hudson River were the Tappans. And I love the name of that bridge, Tappan Z, because it's both a Native American name, the Tappans, and Z for the Dutch Sea waterway. So it was the Tappans Waterway. You know, and now that's, you know, when they changed that name, you know, they lost that link to the past. And then, uh, you know, up in Ossining is called Ossining because the group there was called the Sinsinks. Well, the Kichawanks, the Tonki Techies, the Rekgawa Wanks, which I love, the Hackensacks, wonderful names. And my favorite, though, is a group in New Jersey called the Black Minquas. And they said it's the Dutch report. It's not because their, their skin is dark, but it's because they paint large black squares on their torsos. You know, and it, it is probably, I imagine, I'm guessing, you know, so at a distance you could see who they are. Yeah, uh, let me go through this because I've got a lot to cover, but I, hold on to that thought. On the Dutch map at the, of the time, this is what their great castles looked like. They were enclosed, big enclosures, very solid, very sturdy. They said these planks were maybe 10 inches thick. 
and inside were longhouses, and in each of these longhouses, up to five or six families could live, so there were very large communities. These were all, of course, destroyed on purpose to make you think that the Indian culture was nothing, and that was by design, but their structures were strong and very durable. And they had a hole in the top for the smoke, and then they would build fires in a line down the center, and of course the people would cook and eat on either side of them, and just jam-packed with people. Street, they called them these streets, and trees within, and at night they would pile brush here. You know, it was reported from the Mystic Massacre that they would put brush at the entrances at night so they could see, you know, hear anything happening at night. Circular and, and square, the great castles, and of course, that's what the Europeans called these structures, castles, and that's why North Castle is called North Castle because there was a large structure there. It's mostly speculated that it's on the IBM High Plateau. And these are not the Munsees because we have just one picture of them, but these are Western uh, people, but just evocative. This is the only painting or depiction that we have of the period of time of the people drawn by a European, but they, he has a, a, a fortress looking structure as a tattoo here. He has snakes up his arm. He has tattoos on his face. I don't know what this is, but his hair is hanging to one side. And this cloth could be used as bedding or warmth or a pillow or to carry things. It was multi-purpose. And they had these leather gaiters on their legs, as she did too. But she also has snakes on her and uh, tattoos on her face. And this hanging a pot in a tree, any time they got a gift. There's a great book called a, a History of New Netherland by Adrian Vanderdonk, who was a contact period reporter. So if you visited someone, you gave them a gift, and they would hang, hang it in the tree outside their dwelling. And in, in Greenwich, what we found artifact-wise, we have Bernie Powell in the 50s did his research at Indian Field. Here's some of the uh, artifact that he found. I, I, I've spoken to him. He's passed away now, but he was such a funny guy. I mean, you know, fun, lots of great stories. This is the pottery that the Wekaskek made, very distinctive um, striations at the top. And in fragments, uh, the Dundee School has this most amazing uh, artifact collection of Indian arrowheads and pottery shards from the Dundee Rock Shelter. Uh, the, it does, the, the exhibit's not dated or anything. I don't know who did it. But they have this at, at the Dundee School office. It was just, I was blown away to see that. And this is Sam Bridge, uh, you know, when he, Sam Bridge Sr., he used to, uh, in the 20s and 30s, drag uh, smooth the, some of the great estates with horse teams. And in doing so, he found a lot of arrowheads. And these are, are some that he found. They're white. They, they felt that the white was a better, you know, more powerful uh, arrowhead. And this is what Mr. Bridge found. And this uh, is the nice collection from Greenwich Historical Society of what they had. Um, Mr. Bridge was telling me that he one day found an incredible tomahawk in a stone wall. But then there was a burglary, and the only thing they took was the tomahawk. Ah. And also, Bruce Museum has quite a nice uh, collection. Here, here are some of the pottery shards where you can see that kind of marking. And this is found, the same kind of marking is found down near Manhattan. So of course, um, in the 1630s, they originally were there to pirate. And then, you know, when, I don't, I don't think there was any, there was no report of them getting a Spanish ship at any time. So they turned to trading for animal fur. And I can't tell you how many tens of thousands of animals were killed in that. You know, it was very lucrative and they, you know, they were, they, um, the people would go, far, Indian people would go far inland for pelts, very far away. It must have taken them days to get there and get back to trade here on Manhattan. This is a, printed backwards by the printer, but this is the original fort. It's a five or six sided mud brick, always in disrepair. Here they are coming to trade. They would also, of course, come to trade from um, 
the uh, saltwater marshes in New Jersey. Uh, you know, they did very well at first, very profitable. But they, when the Dutch came, they, they claimed a whopping amount of land. The land they came because they had a fort down here in Delaware. They claimed all the land from Delaware to Maine, and they called it New Netherland. Uh, in the 1640s, uh, things started going wonky there because it was run by Willem Kieft. Willem Kieft was in, tremendously unsuited to his job. But, you know, the Dutch West India Company didn't support Manhattan. They, they gave them no money for roads or hospitals or, or churches, streets, uh, schools. No, it was nothing like that. It was just supposed to be a trading post, and that's all they wanted out of it. They didn't want to spend the money on uh, infrastructure. And, in fact, they had just lost a big war down in Brazil. Uh, things were going wrong for them uh, in, in uh, northern Africa. So they were really, you know being, trying to be economical. And then they had this guy here who was not trained to be a governor. He was just trained to run a trading post. He's an alcoholic. He was very, um, he made terrible decisions that endangered the Indian trading alliances that had been built over the years. And, you know, he systematically destroyed that relationship. Uh, and so the conflict became known as Keefe's War. Uh, and, and it was a case of cultures just not understanding each other or not wanting to understand each other or really in open conflict with each other because it became an endless cycle of retaliation. You know, there was no fencing here. Can you, it's almost impossible to imagine this land to the Hudson River where they said before there were roads and fences, you could easily walk from Greenwich to the Hudson River and back in a day. Uh, just imagine that, because it's really not that far away. But you find that impossible to believe with all the super highways you know, in the way today. Well, European livestock with no fencing trampled over the also unfenced fenced native planting grounds and trampled it. So the Indians, you know, that really affected their ability to eat or make it through a winter. You know, my, my crop is gone, what am I gonna do? So they would retaliate and kill the livestock. You know, and then that escalated and they started killing each other. And Kieft was very unfair. Uh, there was a, originally a very controlled system of licensing. You had to ha have a license from uh, Kieft and the people down at Fort Amsterdam to trade um, so that they could keep it under control so that all the hides went back to, new, to uh, Holland rather than other places or no tra trade was prohibited with the English. They, no, you know, no selling of alcohol, knives, guns, rifles to the Indians, but you know, they didn't police it very well, and things got out of hand that way. And he was very unfair. You know, he would, of course, give preference to Europeans over Indians. So, you know, they were just up in arms. I mean, it was just escalating into a huge problem. And people were afraid. People clamored, you know, the locals who lived around here, uh, up along the Hutchinson River, in Westchester County, along the Hudson knew they had a big problem in Governor Kieft. There was frequent robbery, arson, murders occurring, uh, rapes. Uh, really, you could be friends with a native person and vice versa in one day, and they could kill you the next day. You just never knew what was happening. It was a very frantic time. Talk, it was sort of a time of terrorism also. This, was, this tile is from a dig they did in Lower Manhattan uh, right before they put a big skyscraper up. Uh, and it, it is a Dutch soldier of the time. And this uh, is leather. I mean, this is you know, usually deer skin. This is called a snap haunts, snap haunts with very large caliber bullets, big lead bullets, very short. They said that they even developed short little, Keeft himself developed a short little knife to disembowel natives at close range. At the same time Greenwich was founded, the English were sweeping down from their bases at, up in Boston. 
and uh, and they landed on Greenwich. They they came to Greenwich because Stanford would not allow a member of their party to 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 live in Stanford, and that was. Captain Daniel Patrick and his wife, Anna. Captain Daniel Patrick was a real lout, uh, not respected at all, uh, cheated on his wife. Uh, Governor Winthrop kicked him out of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. The ch no church would have him anymore. Stanford wouldn't have him anymore. So he moved, had to move just beyond Stanford bounds when they came down here into our area. He was an English person, but he had been uh, grown up in Holland, he had trained in Holland, he was a member of the Holland uh, Dutch militia, and his wife, Anna van Byron, was Dutch herself. Robert and Elizabeth Feek were English people, so it was a mix of Dutch and English people who were our founders. They first lived in um, Watertown, west of Mass Bay Colony, for nine years before they came down here. So Elizabeth had first married Henry, the son of the governor, Governor John Winthrop, his son, Henry, she married him. Her sister married John Winthrop Jr., so they're tightly related. Henry died his first day in America. He, too, was a teenager that we might call having a, you know, attention deficit disorder. He was, couldn't concentrate. He couldn't you know, complete duties. He drove his father kind of crazy. He said he was going, he went, to, he sent him to Bar Barbados to run a plantation down there in the 1600s. And he said, oh, I'll make a fortune down there. And he, but he sent back barrels of rotten tobacco, you know, didn't know how to farm it, didn't know how to ship it, didn't really care, didn't want to be there. So he came back to England, uh, married Elizabeth against both families' wishes. Elizabeth uh, arrived, or he missed the boat with his father coming over, I think on purpose. And um, when he got here, he landed in Salem, just north of Mass Bay, and he saw an Indian village on the shore. And after 10 to 12 weeks at sea, eating you know, hardtack, he said, well, I'll just jump in the river and swim over and see them. Well, he jumped in the river and died. And he had been in here for about three hours. So Elizabeth was pregnant with his child, and he, she came about three weeks later uh, and moved in uh, with her sister and brother-in-law and the rest of the Winthrop's up in Mass Bay Colony. So and then they moved, she married Robert Feek up there, and they lived in Watertown for nine years before then they came south because people were saying the uh, Connecticut River Valley is so lush and fertile, it's not so rocky, come on down. So they brought all their kids with them, and in the purchase, she bought a Greenwich Point for herself. And it's very likely that she was a midwife or had medical training because her husband, uh, Robert Feek, was an alchemist. Her father was a pharmacist or apothecary. She had run his business for years in London. Robert Winthrop Jr. was also uh, the major physician for most of the state of Connecticut helping people through his network of midwives. So we have no, they're transcribing his medical journal right now, it's taken years. Um, but it, in all likelihood, it seems most logical that she had medical training. And their purchase here was part of Old Greenwich. So it went from Tomac Cove, which is right now on the Greenwich-Stanford border, uh, on this side is Tomac Cove, and on this side, it's that creek that runs through Binney Park. So the, this was the Totemuk Brook, and this is the Asimuk Brook, the brook that runs through Binney Park. And she hears her, the point, and the, it's about, the point inland is about 12 miles in, straight north, as the deed says, and it's right, right up here where the road says Old Corner Road and T Totemac Road, right there. It's right next to Pound Ridge Country Club. So that's the original purchase, which has a lot to do with the formation of our state in this area. Why? Because Greenwich was purchased 18 days after Stamford was founded. Stamford was founded as a jurisdiction of the New Haven colony. However, when uh, the Feeks and Patricks bought here in Greenwich, three months later, you know, they were unsure of the jurisdiction at that time. There was um, some people in Stanford said, oh, yes, you're English. Don't worry about it. However, the Dutch on Manhattan sent soldiers up in three months 
armed, uh, claiming Greenwich as a Dutch territory, and they capitulated to the Dutch. They brought their children within a week down to Fort Amsterdam for baptism, even though Stanford was right around the corner. And Greenwich remained a Dutch territory for its first 16 years. But you can see that this, this is the line. There was a treaty that drew the line between the Dutch and the English. And that, that uh, first purchase is part of this line that the Dutch and the English recognized. So an event that involves Greenwich within Keith's War is that in Manhattan, there is a wheel maker who was decapitated by an Indian man. But there's a backstory, and that the Indian man, as a boy, had seen a man jump his mother, who was heavily clothed in wampum belts. Wampum is that tiny bead shell currency. It's blue and white, and they graded it. So they used it as a currency there, too, but they also used it as decoration. So this woman had many belts on her, and the European jumped her, cut them off of her, and then killed her. And her little boy was hiding in the bushes and witnessed the whole thing. So when he grew up, he, he recognized Klaus Switz and jumped him and decapitated him. And his head was found five years later. Um, so, you know, you know, you can see what was going on there. Well, everyone, you know, was just horrified or used this to ignite things. Daniel Patrick, you know, getting in on the action, because he knew a lot of the Dutch soldiers in Manhattan, said that the murderer is hiding in or near Greenwich. And at this time, Keefe swore, this is Wall Street. This is why Wall Street was built. Uh, the wall of Wall Street was a uh, protective fencing for Keefe swore. But, you know, I, I guess they figured they wouldn't, I mean, I always wonder, like, why didn't they, what did they do about water access, you know? But they must have had, you know, patrols there. So in Greenwich, the Sachem Mayanus, now remember, Greenwich is a Dutch territory. Stanford is English. In Greenwich, the Sachem Mayanus attacked three armed European men. Where? We don't know. Mayanus killed one, wounded the second. The third man kills Mayanus, take, decapitates him, and brings his head to Manhattan to show that Keith's War had even spread to their most eastern boundary. The native name for the Mayanus River was the, either the Ketchkawes or the Ketchkos, or Kachkos is the native name for it. Europeans renamed it the Mayanus to remember him. So or there were a couple, two forays of Keefe's War that happened in Greenwich. In the first foray, there were some deaths and, and kidnappings in Koskob. 18 to 20 were killed. There was a foray that started off Greenwich Point near Tomac Cove. They came up uh, the Mianus River. And they say near here, which would be Lower Stanwich Road area. Um, you know, it was just some women and children and some old people in a village in this winter. Uh, but they were often hostages, or the, like today, they're still a currency, hostage trading. They took them as hostages, killed some people, burned all of the food that they had, you know, from a very significant structure there. And an Indian man said, you know, he turned on his own people, he was a traitor, and he said he would lead the Dutch to the, a huge massing of native people. On a, a second, the second foray, Kieft sent Dutch soldiers to Tomac Cove. It was three boats of largely mercenaries. Uh, so they landed here, uh, and from this point, they started the march to the large massing. The large massing was in February of 1644. It was, they recorded an extremely cold day, heavy snowfall, but a full moon. So the full moon shining on the snow, you know, lit up the night for their trek. Uh, and then the Dutch document has a very good document. However, it's, imp it's pretty impossible to pinpoint the location, even though there are many locators in the document of where the site was. Um, so they, but they did march from morning till about 10 o'clock at night in a northwest direction. 
and in this attack, they, you know, I won't go into all the details about it, but they surrounded the wooden structure, the castle. They didn't allow anyone to get out, and of course it's all wooden, so they, they threw torches and torched them. And then one evening, the, the native sources say 500 to 700 were, were killed in one night. I mean, it's just horrifying. You know, but that was the, you know, the, these people were used to this kind of gruesome warfare in Europe. You know, the English fought in the, the, the Scots and the Irish. Bloody, bloody war of the time. So there are four historically proposed locations, and I don't know why my little thing is not showing here. So, you know, historians over time have proposed some different locations uh, here, 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 and of course, Koskob, the Battle of Strickland Plain. I don't believe I've looked at the topography uh, of the different sites. However, I have my own thoughts about where they might be. This was probably uh, not the big event, but the small event where hostages were taken. But the site has never been verified. Uh, after this, uh, they sought a peace treaty in Stanford. They sort of didn't get it, really. No one wanted to sign the paper saying that was true. But interestingly enough, at that time of the peace treaty, just after this event, uh, one third of English Stanford's population moved across Long Island Sound uh, to settle near Astoria. And people said they never understood why. They thought it was a religious difference, but no, it was, you know, too fearing, rightfully so, there would be retaliation. Daniel Patrick was killed by a Dutch soldier in Stanford because the murderer was never found, and they thought that he was just leading them on a goose chase for his own amusement. So he was shot and killed there in Stanford, and the murderer, they let him go because they thought it was justified. The native population never really recovered, and then William Keefe was finally recalled, uh, and he was almost home to Holland, but his, there, was a ship, there was a storm and a shipwreck. He was lost in the shipwreck, along with a suspicious fortune in Gilders. So, you know, it, it, it fizzled out, but there were still outbursts. You know, when our Elizabeth went to Astoria area, it, there was a flare up again and it burnt, burnt her house down there as well. But I wanted to move on to the English and the Dutch dispute where again, Greenwich is right in the middle of, you know, two global powers fighting. So, you know, we know that the Dutch claimed it's such a huge landmass, they could never possibly defend that. But, and here's Stuyvesant at the time, this was two directors after Kieft. And, but the English from Massachusetts were spreading down, you know, our way. This is John Winthrop Sr., our Elizabeth's father, uh, ward, guardian, father-in-law, uh, and uncle. So this is just some period dress from the Plymouth uh, plantation people. So this is, you know, the working people. This is what our people would look like. So the English coming closer from Mass Bay down to us. They had a Hartford. They had a fort at Hartford. They uh, were in... Uh, um, uh, Stanford, uh, and then on to us. So I've made the, the yellow are the English uh, initial uh, places, settlements. The white are the Dutch. The Dutch were really here first, and they had spread up into Connecticut, into Hartford. They were, of course, the great Dutch patroon ships along the Hudson River where they had massive, massive plantations. But you know, a lot of them lost it in the American Revolution because they bet on the wrong side. Their lands were confiscated. They even had a, a place down a settlement in Delaware, at a place called Swanendale, and so that's why the Native Americans called Europeans Swanikins from that. Um, but uh, they call the Native Americans uh, also called the English Owenucks. We don't know why, but the Dutch called the natives uh, wild. Uh, wilden, wild men, and the English called them savages. So this, of course, they couldn't defend that, so the, the uh, 
last place they could defend their territory near Manhattan was right here at Greenwich. Greenwich became the boundary between the Dutch and the English, or the, it was the boundary between New Netherland and New England. So I always laugh when they say it's the gateway to New England because really it was the gateway to New Netherland. And the, the border, the defended border between New Netherland and New England was the Innes Arden Country Club Creek. That is the Tomac Creek. I know, it's amazing. You would say it's so insignificant. So this is the purchase. So, you know, here we are, you know, s stuck in the middle. Uh, but how are, you know, over time the Dutch were weakening. You know, they weren't being uh, funded by the Dutch West India Company. They were losing wars in different places. The Indian War was wildly expensive. Uh, fur trading was much less profitable now. And so the English kind of swamped the Dutch, which had a very small population. The English had huge population. They said in 10 years, there were maybe 25,000 English came over in ships during this time. Uh, and so the English began claiming land that had formerly belonged to the Dutch, including Greenwich. So Stuyvesant was really trying to block this flow of English down toward Manhattan. And so what he did to shore up his title is he, from the Native Americans here, bought all the land from the Mianus River to the Stanford Mill River, which is natively called the Soe Ruck or Soe Rut. So this was, he, Stuyvesant had this deed. And Elizabeth, in a letter, saying the governor, the governor has bought all our land. So that was the Stuyvesant sort of overpurchase to try. And his secretary says the governor has done this to try and block the English from cl coming closer to us. So that border, there was another negotiation, the Treaty of Hartford in 1650. And that border moved three times during different events. But now where we are now is the original border. Our border with Stanford is that original Feek Patrick border. So it, we were a Dutch territory for our first 16 years. I'm trying to get that plaque down at Greenwich Point changed because you know for a long time they said we were founded by New Haven Colony, but it's definitely not true. Uh, it was then governed by the strict New Haven Colony, but Dutch res uh, residents here at the time protested violently at that. They wanted to remain Dutch because the Dutch were very lax governors here. They said that we've treated the Greenwich people as neutrals. And then New Haven Colony failed, and the Connecticut Colony began governing us. So I have to tell you, at the same time, this New Haven Colony, when they took over, they too were greedy for Greenwich. And they slandered our Elizabeth of Winth the Winthrop woman fame. I write so what I consider the nonfiction version of the Winthrop uh, woman in this book, which goes into all of her things that happened to her in great detail. Um, they, Robert Feek, you know, Henry was her first husband who died his first day. Her second husband was Robert Feek, who was well off and well respected up in uh, Watertown. However, he began to have uh, mental instability and it got so bad that she, very shortly after their last child was born, like 10 days or so, Something must have happened, and she said, you know, you really have to go back to Boston and get care. I can't take care of you here. So he left the family, returned to Boston. So she, um, don't know, it's not documented how she met William Hallett, or we don't have any lineage. I know the 11th generation William Hallett very well. He's still trying to find out how did he get here, and who was he related to? You know, how did he, how did he get here? We just don't know, it's a black box, but anyway, they wanted to marry. Well, New Haven wanted her land, so they put up all kinds of roadblocks to that, her marrying him. So she took advantage of her Dutch jurisdiction here, and she went down to Manhattan and got a marriage through the Dutch. English didn't recognize it. They slandered her. They started this whole adultery story, but it was just a way for them to make a land grab. Uh, she was also slandered by her nephew and... Um, her son-in-law, Thomas Lyon, because they were in line to inherit part of the first founding purchase, which in itself was 
I think, Greenwich's first real estate battle because it had been bought by four people. And you know where the boundaries were of that purchase were very confused. Uh, so New Haven, in wanting this, um, they say, you're not respecting our English laws. Uh, but she, they, she said, but I'm Dutch. So they said, because you're not respecting our laws, we're going to come. We're going to take your land away and save it from the Dutch. And we're also going to take half of your children. So, and also, there was an arrest warrant for her within English jurisdiction. So she and William and the kids and a cow get on a boat off of Gren you know, near the water and go up to New London where w Winthrop Jr. lives and they stay with him for a year. Then Winthrop Jr. and Stuyvesant negotiate for her return to Greenwich to farm because they have to feed the children, so, you know, have to be self-sufficient. So she did come back to Greenwich for a year. However, you know, when Stuyvesant bought that overpurchase, they were very worried. William Hallett writes a letter saying, I, uh, you know, the English may take over here, and if the English take over, we're in real trouble. I mean, look at the irony of that. Here she is, English royalty. She's a Winthrop, and she's safer under the Dutch than she is under the English for her land, you know, coveted Greenwich. Um, uh, so when they come back, they just preempt the, the, you know, the English taking over, and they leave. They go down, and they they... Stuyvesant has given uh, them a title to a very large farm down there in what's known as Astoria today is where they settled. So you would think that's enough, but no, there's more. <laughs> then Connecticut Colony and New York Colony start fighting over Greenwich because if you notice the boundaries of the first purchase, uh, uh, um, it changes dramatically. So Greenwich, in this battle between colonies, we lose huge amounts of land. So here, the first purchase border is relatively north, you know, going this way. And it was 12 miles inland. Remember I found that, that sign at 12 miles, Tomac Road and Old Corner Road right here? Connecticut Colony decided it wanted to, all of these towns to have borders this direction and line them up like matchsticks in order. So this was out of line. So they decreed that this would go to Stamford and this would go to uh, Westchester County. This is called, this is, you know, this is called the eight mile line. Our current border here is now eight miles from, from a point down here, eight miles. And, but we originally claimed the 12 mile line. It's called, if in the documents archives, they say the 12 miles, the 12 mile, or this is called the four mile within it, and Fauconier's purchase, and he was a purchasing agent for the English governor. Uh, so Fauconier's purchase is often mentioned, and then we lost this huge wedge here, which is on e the Mayanus River sweeps through here, so it's that Mayanus River gorge. We owned that, and the people, the Greenwich people at the time were so upset. You know, they went to court four times to get this back. They promised John Mead, you know, we'll give you Little Captain's Island and Great Captain's Island, you know, we'll give you anything, you know, if you can get that land back for us because they didn't want to start paying taxes to Stanford. You know, the, the, they firmly believe that, you know, that was belonging here. And also the rye border took at least 100 years to straighten out. They would decree, the colony would decree this is the border, but they never marked it. So ta the poor people who lived here near the border, they would have tax collectors from both jurisdictions come collecting taxes. There was a small riot over there in Rye, in Rye because of that. I mean, what a world. So look at what it did to our land, though. So, you know, we're very familiar with, you know, how old, old Greenwich is here and Riverside is here. So originally they owned, you know, we owned all of this. But when they made that decree to straighten out this line, you know, right here at Havemeyer Road, um, that's all we, we lost. I mean, this is old Greenwich and Riverside now, but it used to be enormous. And it used to be enormous. We used to have Bedford and Armonk up here. Many of our people had relatives, and they had lands and farms up here. So that's, you know, why we have the borders that we have today, why they look like they do. But I wanted to then quickly go on to what happened next. What happened next is they developed, you know, they needed municipal revenue. So they developed a system where they fenced off all of the peninsulas as 
um, municipal properties where, where you had to, to, if you wanted to live in Greenwich, you had to agree to work the municipal fields so that the, you know, the governor, government would have some money. So this, you know, there was, this was private property. This was always private property, Greenwich Point. This was never part of the municipal system, but there was um, Mayanis Neck was the name for Riverside. Coscob Neck here, Rocky Point here, Pipen Point here, where Grass Island is, and then there is uh, Horseneck, the Great Horseneck Common Field, which is now Bellhaven, and Byram Neck here. So there was at one time a fence line, of one common fence line that ran from the Mianus River all the way to the Byram River, and then you could have your private farm, you know, on this side of the fencing. So they call it, the native name for land on the west side of the Mayanus River was called Paihamsing. But the Europeans named it Horseneck. And this is a picture from the 20s, and I think you can see better. You know, you can see this is an upside down horse's head. This too looks like a dog to me. But, you know, we don't know. It's not documented why they named it Horseneck. But this uh, Bellhaven was the first common field developed because you know it's low and rolling, not not huge rocky cliffs like in some of the area, much easier, safer for livestock. So I want to give you my hypothesis of how Coscob got its name. As we said, Minus River I found was natively named the Ketchkos or Kachkos or Ketchkos. So I'll go with Kachkos. And I found this in the deed to Westchester County Eastern Half, which is actually the deed of Greenwich. It is the Stuyvesant Purchase. And he describes it and where this name occurs. So I believe that Coscob is named for its most distinguishing uh, geological characteristic, which is that huge inlet from the Ketchkos River. I believe that's why they started calling it Coscob for the, for the native name of the river. Pemberwick was named natively Pimblewog. However, Chickahominy is named for a Civil War battle, so it's not a native name. Uh, and so when they, you know, they lived in Old Greenwich for about 80 years before they actually um, had homesteads over here. They would drive their cattle, livestock, you know, up valley, up, up the Sheep Hill Road, which was called Mutton Town Ridge, the crossing at Palmer Hill, and then come down into Coscob, where they had fields for their livestock. But they, um, you know, there were there was some uh, um, discussion that you know now we can we're safe. You know, the the wrangling between the Dutch and the English is over, and the New Haven colony and our founders is over. So they felt safer to now cross the river and settle homesteads on this side of the Manus River. But the first site that they wanted to, to look at was down near um, the Boys and Girls Club on Horseneck Lane, right by the water. However, that was the year that the Dutch actually took New York back for one year. And there were armed Dutch ships sailing up and down the, uh, the, the Long Island Sound. So that's not safe. So they pulled back and they settled a mile inland on what they call the Greenwich Town Plot. And that's up where the Episcopal churches and uh, the synagogue and Knapp's Tavern. This is the Greenwich Town plot. And they, would ha they had homes really up till the Greenwich Library era and then it drops down, but radiating off of this road on the left were the first roads were the roads to farm the common fields. And if you're in Coscob looking up at the Stanford at the plot, you know we have this great, you know, highway that goes straight to the hill from the high school, you know, straight up here. But originally they had two things. They had steps here, which they pulled up in the revolution, and then they had this switchback that you would you would it starts down here in uh, you know on the other side of the post road and it goes up and then makes a switch and comes comes into Old Church Road there. And this is the original Episcopal chapel for Christ Church there. But that switchback was uh, uh, archaeologically investigated, oh, 
30 years ago. They, they did some digs on it. And you can still see it. I took this picture before the new high school stadium, and it is still there. It, it, you know, it, the, the, high, the uh, post road is cutting part of it off, but you can see how it did, and then it turned, went up there. And here it is, you know, the, the flat, road, or what remains of the road bed of that historic place, which was there for about 170 years. And they did that for protection, you know, to make it hard to get up there. And this is, you know, this one, that's why, you know, what Putt came down, you know, when his, okay. So, and then, you know, when they really got rolling, uh, when they were under the, when we were under the management of Connecticut Colony, that's when serious record keeping started to begin. They uh, looked, they, they had land lotteries to, to develop these huge amounts of land that we had. Now that they had, in old Greenwich, the plots were tiny little farms, but they saw the rest of Greenwich was enormous, and they looked to how do we most, um, you know, how do we develop this most, um, I wouldn't say equitably, but I would say um, fairly. So they would very systematically decide uh, lots or, or areas of town that they wanted to have a lottery on. Everyone could participate in the lottery who was a freeman. There were restrictions. And the lot sizes were not even. And there were no roads to them. You would decide how much money you wanted to spend and you know, put in your, uh, your number uh, into the bowl. And then they would draw the lottery names. And the lottery name um, process is if you were the first one drawn, you got your first choice of land placement. And um, then after the lottery was over, you would horse trade with your neighbors to put together contiguous parcels of land. But there were still no roads to them. There was no way to get there. And there had nothing on them. And then the, they were the upper. Uh, so North Mayanus was one of the first lottery held to develop the upper and lower Hasekee Meadows. The lower Hasekee Meadow ran from Lockwood Road in Old Greenwich. Uh, we don't know how far up it went, but perhaps past the post road. And the upper Hasekee Meadow is upper north uh, Coscob. Mayanus Neck Common Field was developed that way. Land between the Brothers Brooks, the East Brother and the West Brother. Uh, and the fields below the country road, Coscob Neck, all the necks were eventually developed, and then the two Cox purchases, which make up our western border. Here, here's a particular thing that from Native Americans, uh, we had Cox purchase one and two. Originally, um, indiv individual people bought from Native Americans. However, uh, the colony decreed that there can be no straight two na Native purchases because the, the town wanted to issue title to property owners. So if you bought from natives and you kept it, you were essentially your own municipality. So those who had purchased uh, here, the town bought it back, owned the title, issued the title, and then resold it to the people who had bought from natives so that the town was issuing the title. So eventually, here's a, a, you know, it's much more detailed than this. The, in Old Greenwich, of course, was first developed here. This is the second development and the third lottery development. The fourth was the upper and lower Hasekee Meadows. When they crossed the river, they, they developed what they call the mile and half. Many, many houses were, you were in, in the mile and half, below the mile and half, above the mile and half. But a mile and a half is about um, oh, where uh, Round Hill breaks off Lake Avenue is a mile and a half mark. They, they marked it by stone monuments. There were no roads at all. And this is a development uh, area. And then over here was number 6, 6A and 6B on the western side. And then they called these dividends. And, you could, and then people would buy multiple parcels all through town. It wasn't uncommon to hold like 
eight parcels throughout town. Of course, you wouldn't develop it all. You would just hold it as an investment. And if it hadn't been developed or with no house or fencing road to it, um, someone wanted to buy that, they were buying your right to that land so that you were you bought either dividends or land rights. And then up here in the, in the northeast corner of our town in 1732 became Stanwich Parish and the, cor and the line of Stanwich Parish is Lake Avenue, cuts in like that. There was a, in, your own, in your parish, you had to, we had Old Greenwich Parish or Old East Society, Old Society Parish, we had uh, Horseneck Parish and Stanwich Parish. You had to pay extra taxes for the minister and you had to uh, drill in their militia. So people, there was hardly any ministers. They couldn't keep a minister, either in Old Greenwich or Horseneck. So the Stanwich people said, the farming up here is much better. It's easier for us to get to. And so they formed their own parish. It was mandated you had a minister by the Connecticut colony, but they could barely afford that. These are the lines of our part of Stanwich. So the big conundrum was we can't afford to pay a minister. These people were poverty stricken. So Connecticut Colony created this thing called Stanwich that would be half Greenwich, half Stamford, and the church would be in the middle of the two. But I found the other half of this map uh, at the New York Historical Society. And it is this. So this is the other half of that parallelogram which the colony mandated. So we see this. Now here's what I love about this map. That this map remembers the original purchase. The original here is Greenwich Point. Here is Havemeyer right there where the, where the angle change was. So here's our current line. But look, this parallelogram, here there's a little pencil mark. This is the original purchase, and the, the Stanwich Parish line remembers that original purchase of 1740. I think that's just fantastic. So our, from that, our 1640 our, um, European beginning is remembered. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Any questions? Yeah, I got one. I'm still court. Okay. Oh, yes. Yeah. That, uh, I'm still court. I was born and raised in Greenwich. But I'm still court. But I know shots used to be wars. Yeah. When I was a little girl. Yeah. But I'm still court. What was that? You know, it was probably a part of a farm there. I'm still court. You yeah. The little I'm still court. Yeah. That I used to live there. Yeah. Off the farm, I thought there was a swamp. Well, a long time ago. I mean, look, but. Likely, most of this was farming. Their houses were tiny, tiny little things. Yeah. Yeah. Let me just go on. When you listen to all the names of tribes, we always hear about the Sil Silinoi tribe. Oh yeah. All the way back. Oh, that's a story. The, the Siwanoi, the original map for the Siwanoi was that located them uh, uh, down in Delaware, and Adrian Vander Donk had a map maker in Europe draw this. And um, Siwanoi is not here. The Siwanoi is not here. Likely they were either on Long Island or in Delaware. Because there's a lot of talk. They were, the Siwanoi means the, the southerners. The southern, or Sia, Siavanus is what they were called. But they were definitely not here. And then Sinawoi Road is uh, just a misspelling of people who were never here. So, <laughs> so. yeah, go ahead. Was it purchased, and how was that recorded? It was, we have it was the document that I saw as a third as a third grader. The um, uh, it, uh, there were eleven Europeans involved, and maybe eight uh, Native American peoples. But the document has all of their names on it and their marks, so we have that. And where is that recorded? In the town hall vault, okay. right in this building, is that document beautifully conserved. And now I've transcribed all those documents. Thank you. Yes. What year did they reconstruct Hutz Hill? They, um, I think it was in like the 1800s, 1875-ish. 
and then they did it again in, in 1920, and I remember seeing a newspaper story, the pitch was so steep that the newspaper called it the most dangerous road in Connecticut. <laughs> but I have to tell you, but even in the 1600s, they called the land where Greenwich High School sits is the Great Swamp. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming to see us today. This is so interesting. What, do you know the story of Greenwich Avenue? What is it? Yes, I do, because I found it. Uh, that Greenwich Avenue is the fence line between uh, Rocky Neck and Pipe and Point Common Fields. You can see it on a map drawn from Washington, clear as a day. It's a fence line between two common fields. Yeah. Yeah. Was this um, strip farming? You talk about a common field? Um, so that, or was it simply for cattle? It was for cattle, Live, livestock. I mean, they had oxen, sheep, uh, no mention of goats, uh, dry and wet cows. And one of the first things they decided in the first recorded town meeting here in like 1648 was which of the selectmen was going to be the shepherd that year. <laughs> And it was a major decision, too, then to say we're going to combine the flocks of Stamford and Greenwich, and we're going to get a shepherd. And they would, that's why Sheep Hill Road, to drive them up Sheep Hill Road from Old Greenwich to come down Valley Road to Coscob Upper Field and Coscob Lower Field for grazing, because, you know, they ro rotate the grazing fields. Were, they, um, were oyster beds an important economic? I'd not mentioned, but... Yes, I mean, likely they were because there's a great story, uh, Astoria, a uh, William Hallett, story, but it's recorded in the Dutch archives that Stuyvesant was coming up uh, the East River and they had misjudged the tides. And so they pulled over and they, you know, they used paper fuses to light their muskets. And so they saw right off Astoria there, you know, in the water, oysters. So they used their fuses and fried up the oysters for lunch. <laughs> Uh, across the street from the Costco Fire Station, there's a little stone walled area. Looks like a cemetery with a big mound in it. Oh yes, that's the Hitchcock family, 1800s family. Is that what this is? Not Indians or anything. Like no. Yes. The steps carved into stone across. The that's a that's like eight, 19th century construction because he did come down those little stepping stones. But I was telling Fred earlier, you know, he didn't get to Stamford in time. This is a uh, Putnam, General Putnam. But it's very dramatic. You know, he was rushing, of course, to get there, but he didn't get there in time. And you know what? I was, they should have posted people down at Porchester because 6,000 British troops were, came from Porchester up the post road, and they didn't even see them until they were at Second Congo. <laughs> and so and then he took off down the steps. He didn't get there in time. And so the British sacked Greenwich. They just trashed the place. So, you know, we have that happy picture of him trotting down the steps, but, you know, we lost. <laughs> the ownership um, of Greenwich Point, I mean, I can go from here back a little bit, but can you give us a little further back? Now? Well, after, you know, it was first called natively Montecuego, then Elizabeth's Neck, right. which she named, then Todd's Point, and then now Greenwich Point four names for the same place. But after she left and sold it, and I, we have who she sold it to, it was a collection of small farms, fenced in, farms, you know, like five and six acres farms there. Well, could you tell us the new um, thing that our selectmen learned about the medallion of the, of the seal? Printed? Oh, well, this is Putt, you know, r riding happily down the steps, you know, but he didn't, wasn't successful. <laughs> but I do, I mean, we have this other seal of, you know, the pilgrim and the, the Native American, but, you know, it's not a, you, now you know the unhappy story there, you know, that it was a very fraught relationship. You know, I just sometimes wonder, like, who was he married to? Who were his children? You know, who was his family, Mayanis? You know, where did they live? We do have a street called uh, Whitmore Street. As you go down into, um, uh, you know, if you're going to 
Home Depot over there in Stanford, you know, you go down the post road, and on your left, sort of across from Ethan Allen, is Whitmore Street. Whitmore was, had his um, cattle or livestock in the early, early days grazing in that field, you know, that low field. He was jumped and decapitated, and, um, and um, you know, that was a, a tr major trauma for the early community. I mean, that's how f afraid people were. This is part of Keith's war. You know, that uh, Whitmore, and it's right next to, I think, um, Mayas Road. I can't think of it, but it's two historic names right there. Because it's a perfect place on that ridge to look at your cattle down in the field. So, but thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. For, and I do have books. <laughs>